Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new Duquesne Klein Law Library Legal Talk Series. I'm Dana Napshu. I'm the director of the Law Library and an associate professor of legal skills here at Duquesne Klein Law School. It is my absolute pleasure and honor to sit down today with um, Professor Barker and talk about his amazing scholarship and achievement as a faculty member of the Duquesne Klein Law School. So welcome, Professor Barker. Thank you. And thank you for that very uh, exaggerated introduction. But... So let's get started. Okay. I don't want you to become modest because your achievements some of them are here behind us, so there is no way of becoming modest when this speaks for itself. No, so let other people say it than what I do. <laughs> so let's start. How would you like to introduce yourself, Professor Barr? I don't, you know, the quotation comes to mind when um, Nixon appointed Henry Kissinger, the Secretary of State. Reporters asked him that. And he, he said, I do not stand on formality. Your Excellency will be fine. <laughs> so, Professor or Bob. I love that very much. I think for the same reason I got my doctoral degree. Ah. <laughs> so, let's get started. What inspires you to write? Well, writing came naturally. Not in the sense that I have any innate talent, but in the sense that my earliest recollections of writing were from home when I was quite young, and I was expected to write letters of thanks to my grandparents and my aunts and uncles, thanking them for birthday presents or Christmas gifts on various occasions. And I think it's because of that start that writing became more or less part of everyday life rather than uh, a horrifying duty that sometimes arises. And I had, I, I've been fortunate. I had the benefit of 21 years of good solid Catholic education. Uh, St. Joseph's grade school and high school first, and then here at Duquesne in undergrad school, law school, and graduate school. And all of that enhanced whatever abilities I had to write. And then a number of activities that I was involved in tended to reinforce and help develop whatever ability I might have had at writing. Uh, for example, I participated both in high school and as an undergraduate in interscholastic and then intercollegiate debate. And debate and speech certainly was a great asset. I'm glad I did that. And I always had an interest in the U.S. Constitution, mostly to begin with in a historical context and then as a result of debate and law school, it became an, a, a lawyer's interest as well for me. And uh, I think all of those things put together made writing, writing about legal topics, especially constitutional topics, uh, an opportunity rather than an obligation or a burden. And so I've been very fortunate to have had a number of opportunities to speak, especially in Latin America. Over, over the years, I've received about 22, 23 speakers grants from the U.S. Department of State, and I've spoken in most Latin American countries, always on top topics related to the U.S. Constitution. All these topics, by the way, suggested by my audiences, which were bar associations and 
uh, university gatherings, especially law school events. And I enjoyed it. And I hope my audiences did too. And most of my writing, not all of it, but most of it has been a result of my having given talks because I found myself developing, supplementing, augmenting what I had said and producing articles and on a couple of various books. But anyway, it happened step by step by step. I, th I think that uh, for our uh, prospective students, because this recording is also for you, I think the lessons you just learned, just start writing as early as you can, and it will become a second nature. Certainly made it a lot easier, and it made it natural, and uh, made it many times irresistibly attractive. Yeah. That's what we want as attorneys, not only to be wordsmiths, but to be able to write mm -hmm. what we want to say. This is amazing. Thank you. We are moving along with our 10 questions. Number two, we, uh, we just discovered what inspires you to write. So number three, who are your favorite legal writers? I would have to say, uh, I'd have to put Anthony Scalia, Justice Scalia at the top. I think his writings, many of them, parts of judicial opinions, he also Art. has books and articles. Pardon me? He also has books yes. and articles. Yes. I suspect you yes. are going to touch upon that list. Yes, yeah. But his opinions in, for example, United States versus Mistretta about uh, the constitutionality of the independent council arrangement that was in operation at the time. Uh, if his... you want to let us know about that particular uh, decision. For the people who are... I, that was a case in which eight members of the Supreme Court formed a majority, took the position that the independent council statute as it existed at that time back in 1989 was constitutional. There was one dissenter, and that was Justice Scalia, who pointed out that the Constitution says that it shall be the duty of the president to see that the laws be faithfully enforced. And Scalia said, it is clear that the statute in question, that under certain circumstances allowed the appointment of somebody who was not in the ordinary run of things responsible to the president, the purpose of the statute was indeed to take away from the president a certain amount of power to enforce the laws. And Scalia said that's it's a violation of separation of powers. Eventually, by the way, I'm not sure how his colleagues on the court thought about the change later, but most of the members of Congress who were very enthusiastic about establishing an independent council in the wake of Watergate, uh, changed their minds and said, it can cut one way or the other. No, no political party benefits from it or is uh, safe from its scope all the time. But uh, they, they developed a congressional consensus that it was a bad idea. And so the independent council statute was not renewed, it expired. Congress did not renew it. But the point is, Scalia's analysis was clear, concise, to the point. Uh, another case that illustrates Justice Scalia's ability is Heller versus the District of Columbia. It's the case dealing with Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. In that case, Justice Scalia was the majority opinion for five members of the court. My point right now is that he analyzed the scope of the Second Amendment as it was understood at the time the Second Amendment was adopted, which is a 
clear and perfect example of uh, application of the doctrine of original understanding in interpreting the Constitution. He did a fine job of it. He did such a good job that even the dissenters adopted his method of analyzing the matter. They reached a different conclusion. But uh, it seemed as though the court was saying, well, we're all originalists now. But anyway, I would say Justice Scalia is my favorite constitutional writer. And I would put right after him because although they disagree on a number of things, um, Hadley Arcus. Not, not uh, aware. He, he was for many years professor of Amherst. And he has retired from Amherst, and he is now the director of the uh, James Mason Institute of Natural Rights in Washington, D.C. And he has written a lot about natural law, particularly natural law and the United States Constitution, which incidentally, coincidentally, is the title of one of my articles, one of those I am most proud of, that was... Uh, originally published in Chile, in Santiago. And uh, the director of the Review of Metaphysics in Washington, which I understand is one of the top phil philosophy uh, periodicals in the United States, mm -hmm. asked me to expand on that article. It, I wrote the original in Spanish, published in Chile, where he wanted one in English expanded. And I did that. It was published in 2012, the Spanish version in 2011. Uh, and in that, I talk about the influence of the natural law on the leading figures in the framing of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, James Wilson, in particular, John Adams, uh, another. Um, Adams was not part of one of the framers, but uh, he was an influential statesman and jurist at the time. In any event, uh, I like that article and uh, I like Adley Arcus writings and, uh, and I like Scalia's writings and I think that uh, with respect to constitutional interpretation the two of them um, in tandem uh, are among the best sources there are of constitutional thought in our day. I think listening to you I sense um... Um, a, prof a profound respect for the style of the right. I think you mentioned a few times that um, you loved clarity and you loved um, the fact that um, people who have something to say, and um, uh, you use the example of Scalia, for instance, mm -hmm. um, are able to explain their thoughts in such a manner that even others who don't agree with their mm -hmm. outcome or politics, ideology, mm -hmm. nevertheless respect yeah. the way that uh, message is offered. So I see uh, an aesthetician in you, someone who loves the beauty of the written word. I hope so. I hope so. Well, I, I, I was brought up uh, to have respect for good writing and to be able to write clearly and accurately and in an appropriate tone, uh, depending on the occasion, depending on the audience, uh, and so on. So I'm grateful for all of that. I've been the beneficiary of uh, a good attitude toward that. And by the way, law school certainly enhances what anyone's ability to write with clarity because a legal document that is unclear is garbage <laughs> and it, it may well be malpractice. Um, but a lawyer should, should be able to 
speak and write clearly. It's very important to his job or her job. This is amazing advice for our incoming students. So thank you, Professor Bart. We are moving along to question four. What piece of your scholarship would you like to talk about today? I know it's going to be a pretty tough. Well, I, I'd i say there are two. One on... Uh, I think we should talk about them because we have time. Okay. First, I suppose, chronologically first. Uh, in 1989, that was the first of those speakers' grants that I received from the State Department. I spoke in Lima at the Lima Bar Association. Uh, I gave a series of four lectures over a space of a week on the U.S. Constitution, on topics that had been selected by the Bar Association there. And I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Those um, um, those um, uh, events took place with you speaking in Spanish. Yes. Yes. Before we go forward, I would yes. like you to tell us how did you end up? You are a Pittsburgh native, correct? Yes. English is your first language. Yes. How did you end up giving these speeches to Spanish-speaking people in Spanish, writing in Spanish? I think it's formidable. Well, I was fortunate, and most of the credit for that goes belongs to the Peace Corps. I was a U.S. Peace Corps volunteer right after law school. It's the first thing I did after law school. I was a volunteer in Panama. And I worked with two colleagues of mine, uh, with whom I'm still in touch, uh, Panamanian lawyers. And uh, my experience of living in Panama, first of all, going through Peace Corps training, in which intensive Spanish conversation was occupied uh, 22 hours a week for us. Training itself was in Puerto Rico. So if you wanted a beer after the <laughs> formal lessons, you had to be able to ask for it in Spanish. Um, so I got a start there. And then two years in Panama uh, caused me to be less proficient than I wanted to be, but good enough to when push, when I received the call back in 1989, State Department, I was told that uh, the program had already been set up and that the person originally scheduled to give the lectures was not going to be going because the country was in, Peru was in very bad shape at the time with two terrorist organizations running almost at will in many parts of the country. Anyway, I thought about it for a half a minute. And I said, yes, absolutely. I realized <laughs> that this, this was the chance. This was the opportunity I had been looking for. And, uh, and so I wrote, I had about five weeks notice on this. And I wrote in Spanish, in as deficient as it may have been. And I was helped by two of the professors of Spanish in Duquesne's Modern Language Department, Dr. Lucente, who is still here at Duquesne, and Dr. Um, Colecchia, who retired some years ago and has died since. Uh, I gave them my final drafts and they uh, corrected the text. And that's what uh, got it started. I still try when I I'm going to speak or write in Spanish if I can, if I have time, if circumstances permit, I try to give my suggested text to a native speaker, um, especially a lawyer, if I can, uh, to get that review so that uh, so that my Spanish, such as it is, is, is rendered better. 
But anyway, uh, over the years... I have to commend you, not only in the fact that you you wanted to show respect, but in the respect you've been able to show us for someone else's culture. This is true multiculturalism. And I'm saying that because we are in this room, which is named for one of your classmates, correct? Mm -hmm. And um, we try to make it into a multicultural room at the um, suggestion of our Dean Dean Barton. And you are, I think, the right person to be here in this room because your life is such an example of respect for other cultures. Well, and thank you. Um, I've tried in speaking and writing in Latin America to present or promote a better understanding on the part of my audiences to the United States constitutional system. And when I write or do research on Latin America for publication in the US, as I did in the case of Costa Rica, I hope that what I do promotes a better understanding of Latin America, or more particularly the country I'm talking or writing about, on behalf of the people of the United States. So um, I think that's that's part of it. And some of the rest of my writing, the writing on natural law, and also, well, I'll get back to that in a minute, but um, is intended for any interested audience, particularly an audience of jurists, about topics that should be, or I'm, I'm hoping, are of interest regardless of country. Uh, Thank you. Now we can go back. And uh, I apologize for my tangents, but talking to Professor Barker, and I know a little bit about him, I would like to make him as transparent to the future generations, and I think he would like to, to make himself. And uh, let's move on to the first piece of writing. You said it's from 1989. Yeah, I, uh, I delivered those four lectures in Lima. And then when I got back home, I expanded, put them together, and eventually well, I did the same thing with other talks that I had was to give in the future. I was in, I did it in, in Peru in 89. I was in uh, Costa Rica and Panama in 1980 and gave lectures there. And in Paraguay in the year after that. And Oh, after a couple of years, I had enough material on enough areas of constitutional law that I thought I could put them all together as a book. And so I did that and made a few adjustments to smooth one subject <laughs> into the next. And over the years, well, that book, uh, La Constitución de los Estados Unidos y su Dinámica Actual, was suggested by my Peruvian editor. It was published first in Peru, then in Bolivia, then in Costa Rica, and just last year in Argentina. So apparently there's an audience for it or a market for it. And, uh, and I was almost overwhelmed back in 2014. I was in Peru at the University of Cajamarca, which interestingly has each year devotes one week to the constitution. They call it constitution week. They focus primarily, of course, on their own constitution and its history, but they always include jurists from other countries to talk about comparative constitutionalism. Well, I was invited back in 2014 and I was grateful for the opportunity but I was so grateful when I and was surprised 
by the number of students who came holding copies of my book, saying, would you please autograph this for me? It was, uh, it was an ego inflating at the same time humbling experience. I think it's remarkable to think that there are so many people. I think we are talking about millions of people now knowing that it is published in so many countries. Get to understand the U.S. Constitution through the eyes of a Duquesne product. Coming from Duquesne, teaching at Duquesne from Pittsburgh, this is something to be so proud of. And I want to congratulate her. I think it's remarkable. Well, again, I've been very, very fortunate because um, although my parents were not college graduates, uh, they were interested in, my father in particular, was interested in international relations. And so it was always a subject of discussion at home when I was, from the time I was old enough to begin to understand it. Um, international relations were, were important. And I think I learned very early on that uh, the two most important uh, areas, or at least uh, two areas of particular importance for the United States, naturally, uh, were those with uh, Britain and those with our neighbors in the Western Hemisphere. And so I had from the beginning uh, a fascination with Latin America. And there was a, I think it was in fourth grade, but I'm not sure about that, about fourth grade. And I'm not even sure what the course was. It might have been the course called Christian Social Living. But in any event, there was a series of short stories, fiction, about a Spanish boy who lived in the 16th century, whose family moved to the New World and moved from place to place in the New World. And I thought this is fascinating. <laughs> these countries, these places are uh, are very, very interesting. And so I was, I was interested in Latin America. And when I applied to the Peace Corps, one of the questions the Peace Corps asks is, uh, what area of the world would you prefer? What country, if you have a country preference? I did not mention any country preference, but I did say Latin America was my favorite area. Uh, and things that worked out very nicely that way. And by the way, Panama is a great place <laughs> to be introduced to, uh, to Latin America. Well, actually, I was introduced in Puerto Rico through three months of training. And then the two years in Panama were fascinating. It's a small country, but it is very, uh, very interesting. Thank you. You still owe us the second piece of writing. We only talked about your book. Oh, yeah. The second piece I mentioned earlier, and that is the article that I wrote. I was asked to participate in a seminar to be held at the University of Bernardo O'Higgins in Santiago, Chile, on influences on constitutions. And I wrote the actual occasion was the celebration of uh, the French Revolution, about which I'm not expert and about which I did not write and wasn't expected to. I wrote about natural law and the United States Constitution. And that article was then published by the host university in their review. And I was invited to translate my Spanish into <laughs> English and uh, submit the article to an important law re uh, important philosophy review in the United States. And I did that. And that kind of writing, those, that, those two articles, the Spanish version, the English version, I think are useful or might be useful, I hope they are useful to jurists anywhere, 
everywhere in understanding the significance of international law and its beneficial effect on national constitutions. It is very interesting what you are saying, because while we do not have a professor that teaches Roman law right now, mm -hmm. Duquesne used to have a class on Roman law. And I know that there is some um, in the history department, Roman law that is being taught by um, a Duquesne alum, who is also oh. a, a judge. And um, Roman law and uh, natural law definitely underlie the international aspect. Yeah, and of Roman law. law. Ro excuse me for interrupting. No, that. but Roman law was the foundation of the civil law tradition, which, as you know, is the dominant legal tradition in continental Europe and then many other parts of the Latin America. Latin also. America. Yeah. And I, I do teach and have taught here at Duquesne and at the University of Pittsburgh a course on law and legal process in Latin America. And in that course, I devote the first third of the course at least to a study of the sources of the civil law. And of course that begins with Rome and a historical understanding of that helps to explain why in many respects the civil law operates as a distinctive legal tradition and on the other hand, uh, the common law does in English-speaking countries and a few other countries. Um, and again, the, the roots, the historical roots, one tradition, the Roman law tradition or civil law tradition throughout Roman history, the Middle Ages, the modern era, was always developed. The important actors in the growth and development of the civil law tradition were always legal scholars, the professors. On the other hand, the common law tradition developed in England, primarily through the interaction of lawyers serving as advocates and judges who were deciding cases. And that difference in the activities of the most important actors in the development of those traditions explains many of the uh, differences today. Does that make any sense? I think you've offered them the easiest most clear explanation of the differences between the civil and the common law tradition that I have ever, oh, I have ever well, listened thank to. Thank you. I hope I'm correct. I, and I you think... are. You are, and it's amazing. You're absolutely right. Well, so where do you fit in as a professor who is so knowledgeable? This is not one of the questions I'm putting you now, uh, you know, facing you. You as um, a consummate jurist and a faculty member, do you feel that you're closer to a civil law tradition or as an American-American going through the system and knowing the valuable um, aspect of the common law tradition? Have you practiced as a, uh, an attorney? Oh. Uh, as an attorney, I, I could not practice the civil law. Not only am I not... No, in, but uh, in America. So you were a practitioner. Yes. So so knowing that you're a practitioner in the common law, but you are so sophisticated, you are a, philo a philosopher of law, if you want, in my um, no. estimation. You're very kind and generous. So how do you feel your personal affiliation, civil law or common law? 
Well, I I think I'm definitely a common law lawyer, but I hope uh, that I have a respect for and a degree of understanding of what makes the civil law tradition what it is. Uh, so as I tell students when I teach my comparative law, my Latin American law course, this course will not enable you to practice law anywhere in the civil law world. That would require a whole program of legal education. But I hope it will give you as students as, it, as I think it has done for me, uh, given me an understanding of that tradition and those legal systems such that I can understand a good deal of what is going on and why lawyers from that tradition attach importance to some things that we would not regard as very important. And on the other hand, we hold as very important things that are not quite so important there. A good example, when I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Panama, and I was working day to day with two Panamanian lawyers who were about my age, they were fresh out of law school, recommended for their jobs by their dean, and they were working hard on a particular question, problem that had come to them in connection with their activities as legal services lawyers. We set up that program in Panama. That's what I spent most of my time doing. Anyway, the program was in operation, and Oscar and Raul, the two Panamanian lawyers, were spending a good deal of time on a particular real, we would call it in the United States, a real property problem, dealing with rights in land in one of the squatter communities. And they brought me into the discussion just to hear what they were doing. And at one point I asked the eminently naive question, <laughs> well, has your Supreme Court decided this question? They shrugged their shoulders. <laughs> These were not unaccomplished lawyers. These were very bright people, very good lawyers. And they said, well, I think so, but who cares? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just, at that time, in fact, in the country, the official reports of the Supreme Court's decisions were, were published periodically in the legal gazette, which was read only by lawyers and only by lawyers who were living in cases before courts there. Uh, that's it should, that lack of concern about court decisions and their importance is changing somewhat in an informal way. But formally speaking, a court is not bound generally. A court is not bound to decide this case in this way because a higher court has done so in a similar case earlier. Uh, it's more complicated than that. But it, it is, uh, um, I have another good example. More recently, uh, I was invited to Argentina in uh, 2008. I've been there many times, but in 2008, I was invited to go there to be a member of a team of judges, three judges, who would select two chaired professors in constitutional law at the University of Buenos Aires. And that was a, a an enriching experience, by the way. The other two members of the court were law professors from Spain. Anyway, though, we had narrowed field down. I mean, it had been preliminarily cut down to about seven, 
we cut the seven down to three. And then when it came to deciding which of the three would get the first chair, there was a disagreement between the two Spanish professors and myself. We all agreed that the top two were A and B. The disagreement was whether A was better than B or vice versa. And one of the one of my colleagues on the committee said, uh, "Well, may I ask why you think that the B person. is the person who should get it?" And I said in Spanish, "Eres más abogado." He's more of a lawyer. And my colleague said, well, yes, but A, the other candidate, has a more impressive list of scholarly writings. That again reflected a difference between the systems because in the civil law tradition, the legal scholar is the ultimate in the field, and therefore the amount and quality of that person's writings, the influence of that person's writings are very, very important. Well, I, I think naturally as a common law lawyer, attached more importance to the fact that the candidates that I would have ranked first Practice. Practice law, yes, and had a stronger background as a practicing lawyer. They were both good, and everybody realized that whichever one we picked, we could, couldn't be making a significant mistake. But it was an interesting example of the way we weighed candidates. different qualities of candidates, yes. I think that's very interesting and that's very telling. So thank you for sharing it with us. Um, you mentioned that um, there is a, an influence, informal influence from the common law system into the civil law system. Have you noticed during your uh, extraordinary, you know, life, professional life, any influence from the civil law system into our common law system hmm. that you think is interesting I, to share with our not viewers sure it, it is interesting um just to, in my opinion for example I, i've been very um uh, impressed that uh, since scalia made it to the supreme court um all treatises such as uh, brockton's or cox mm -hmm. or um uh, you know commentaries of english mm -hmm. law have been more and more quoted. And I take that in your view as being an example of our Supreme Court justices are looking for amazing scholarship produced maybe by judges in England that occupied also professorial position because mm -hmm. they are not I, allowed. That's an interesting professor. insight. I haven't thought about that in that way. Thank you for... Uh, so I think that, you, you know, the footnotes, when, when you want to try to appeal to sophisticated readers, because mm. who would know, mm. you know, um, commenters of English mm. law or yes. um, the institutes yes. or so forth. Yes. Even Justinian's code is being quoted. So I think this is remarkable, an informal influence. Yeah. Um, to change the subject just a little yes. bit. Yes. Um, I was just something, thinking of parallelism. Something similar has happened in, something close to that has happened in a number of Latin American countries because most of them, almost all of them became independent during the first 25 years of the 19th century. They were, as colonies, they had been part of the civil law tradition. Portuguese but, or Spanish? Yes, yeah. But <laughs> ultimately, the same tradition that has influenced France and Italy and yeah. so on. 
they they the independent countries of Latin America adopted written constitutions uh, following the examples or example one or the other or both the United States or France or Spain and sometimes there was much French influence in the Spanish example um, but the notion well let me start at the beginning what I think is the beginning if you look at Marbury versus Madison Chief Justice Marshall reasoned that the court had the power of judicial review, not because there's any special grant of that power, but because, as he said, it is the uh, quintessential, I'm paraphrasing him, quintessential duty of the judiciary to say what the law is. Um, and so if we've got two laws that might be conflicting with each other, we have to determine whether there is a conflict and if there is, we have to apply the one that is superior. So, uh, well, that sort of thing, as natural as that may seem in the common law, and I think it is natural, and he's absolutely correct in the common law context. But in the civil law, judge, there's very little, if any, tradition of judges doing anything like that. And indeed, the French Revolution, which was fresh in everybody's mind, was anti-judicial. Not a whole lot that is written about the French Revolution is written about the anti-judicial character of it. And separate subject that I won't get into now. But there was so much of a reaction by the revolutionaries against the pre-revolutionary judges that there was a time in France, late 18th century, very early 19th century France, when judges were, at least theoretically, prohibited from interpreting the law. If they had a question of what the law meant, they had to refer the question to either the, at one point, the entire legislature, but then when that became unwieldy, to a special committee of the legislature, which would tell them what the law means, and then they could apply it. Why was that? Well, because it is the function of a legislature to decide what the law is. And for the judge to say, to exercise an independent uh, judgment about the meaning of a law or its applicability or not, is essentially a legislative function. And incidentally, according to that way of thinking, who knows better what the legislature had in mind and the legislature. That's so interesting. This is this is fascinating. I, I hope you all agree with me that we are so grateful to have you here. Oh, I'm sorry for the many digressions. I love the digressions, <laughs> and I apologize when I go into the digressions. <laughs> so we are moving on. So um, we mentioned the uh, two pieces of scholarship, and um, and now we are going to go a little deeper. What are the main ideas? And if you don't mind, I would like to start with the one on natural law, because while natural law is quite, quite popular in the civil law system, I don't think natural law is as popular in the common law system, and especially in the United States, as it is on the continent. Uh, so let's start with those ideas. What brought natural law, other than your Catholic education, I suspect? Well, if you look at the Constitutional Convention of 1787, the leading, the most influential members of the convention, I think by consensus, are James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, James Wilson, and in a very subtle way, George Washington. Uh, he didn't say much, he didn't participate in any debates, but he gave a stability and a reasonableness and a rationality 
to what was going on. Um, and if you look at their backgrounds and their writings, and I do this, I, I look at Madison, Hamilton, Wilson, the three most influential. Um, they, do you mind if they we, were, and, but incidentally, not only Catholic. But do you mind telling um, uh, our listeners or uh, the populations they were representing? So Wilson was representing? Uh, Wilson was a delegate to the convention from Pennsylvania. So we start with Wilson. Hamilton was a delegate to the convention from New York. And Madison was a delegate to the convention from Virginia. So they represented three different states. Uh, they had different careers. Their careers did not depend on each other. Uh, but they all were natural law thinkers. And by the way, it was assumed in England and in the colonies that and then in the United States after independence, that the common law was in essence an expression of the natural law. It's not something that the British or the colonists or the Americans made up. It was already there and had to be applied. And so judges in cases of dispute applied. And so it was natural law thinking. And, and again, if you read my, I'm not the only one to have quoted those people, but their writings make very clear that they thought in terms of a natural law. So did jurists in general. So much so that it didn't have to be labeled as the natural law. But what happened was, or at about the same time, the uh, French Revolution was catching hold and the revolutionaries of the time continued to use the term natural law, but they cut it off from God. They cut it off from, well, instead of understanding as Hamilton and Madison and others did and as thinkers from Sophocles through Aquinas through, uh, well, the list is long. <laughs> um, they understood the, the traditional natural law thinkers understood that the human intellect, human reason is the tool by which the natural law is applied. It's not made up by human reason. However, the revolutionaries in France, mostly in France, uh, made reason the new god. They cut off they, they retained the name natural law, but they meant reason. And we all know what happened in France the in the wake of that, the terror. Yeah. Um, to bring this now to Latin America, the Latin Americans convinced that a written constitution was a good thing to have. Um, were impressed by French declarations of human rights. But at the same time, there was something of a pause there, but didn't go too well in France right after the revolution. So anyway, um, how do we guarantee rights, recognize them, and enforce them. The Latin Americans and most of them looked naturally to Spain 
Um, and Spain, by the way, an interesting case. And, and this is building digression upon digression, but I'll do that anyway. Please. Um, one of Spain's leading cases on enforcement of constitutional rights is called the Fitzgerald case, a very un Spanish name. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Fitzgerald was a Spanish citizen living on the island of Mallorca. And the police, I forget in what year this happened, it was early in the 19th century, oh, quite early in the 19th century. The police entered his house, broke in, uh, apparently did some damage. And he said, our constitution guarantees the inviolability of the home. And the constitution says that uh, Congress shall, as many civil law, well, as many Latin American constitutions also said, copying the Spanish, who copied a lot from the French. Um, the Congress, the legislature, shall suppress violations of the Constitution or shall take notice of violations and take steps to end the violations. So Mr. Fitzgerald wrote to his Congress representatives. I don't know whether he wrote or traveled at this point. He did eventually travel to Paris and complain. <laughs> but anyway, the legislature said, we, we can't deal with this. We can't be bothered with this. And he wrote again or sent his lawyer there or whatever. <laughs> and finally, uh, there was either no response at all or a, uh, we legislate for the nation. We can't be bothered with this. And he would go to meetings of the National Assembly and sit in the visitor's gallery and protest <laughs> as often as he could this violation of his constitutional rights. Anyway, that was a, a significant example early on for the Latin Americans. Uh, that, uh, and a number of Latin American constitutions originally said similar things. That's Congress funny. shall suppress violations of the Constitution. Okay, well, that's, that's not really going to work, or we need something else. And so provisions were begun to give the judiciary some power. Yeah, some power, but that ran counter to a lot of history and a number of principles of the civil law tradition, which had been reinforced in that regard by the French Revolution and its anti-judicial attitude. So some countries gave power to both the Congress and the judges. But anyway, uh, Mexico made a significant contribution when it developed the Amparo. But in the beginning of 1841, it made its first appearance in, in Mexican laws, where simply a law provided that judges shall have the power to protect constitutional rights or, or to protect individuals against unlawful conduct. And so, and the Amparo expanded tremendously in Mexico to become the most significant procedural device in the country's legal system. Uh, but the original umpire, protection of constitutional rights, with more or less amplitude, was adopted in most of the Spanish-speaking countries of Latin America. So the result is, my point right now, is that in most respects, 95% of the law is part of the civil law tradition or is brought from the civil law tradition. And the other 5% or maybe 10% the constitutional part tends to be 
tends to draw on the common law. And because of obstacles to that in the civil law, the Latin Americans, or a number of Latin American countries, especially Mexico, Brazil as well to some extent, uh, Costa Rica also, but anyway, uh, a number of indigenous institutions were developed, especially the Mexican Amparo and Amparo as developed uh, with somewhat different characteristics in other countries. Uh, were developed in Latin America in order to make aspects of what was a civil law tradition workable in a civil law context. And it has been significant. And that's why Latin America is particularly interesting and important area of constitutional study especially because it's necessary to envision both common law tradition and the civil law tradition, the difficulties in causing any given idea to migrate from one tradition to the other, and as a result, the institutions that have been developed, mostly in Latin America, by the way, to accommodate uh, principles derived from constitutional law in the common law tradition and make them workable in a legal system which remains overwhelmingly with regard to most subject matter part of the civil law tradition. This is fascinating. Thank you. So we are going to uh, move on to question number seven. How do you think the publication of the works you mentioned has affected your teaching and scholarship so far? Well, it's had a great effect on the content of my scholarship, on the, the subjects on which I write and the purposes of it. As I mentioned earlier, uh, most of what I've written or much of what I've written has been directed toward foreign, especially Latin American, lawyers and jurists and a good deal of my writing in English here in this country has been uh, geared to the reverse, to making uh, foreign, especially Latin American, uh, legal systems intelligible and in a larger sense to make the civil law tradition intelligible uh, to people, especially jurists in the United States. Question eight, what are you working on right now? Right now, there are four items <laughs> in the pipeline at various stages. One of them I've almost, well, almost given up on. It's a project that began a number of years ago. I translated into English several chapters on adjudication mm -hmm. of a treatise written by a Mexican jurist some time ago. Uh, and then more recently, my research assistant, who himself was from Ecuador, is now practicing law in Pittsburgh, translated a large portion of the remainder of that treatise and then finally, a third graduate of Duquesne, who practices law in Germany now, translated yet other parts, the remaining parts of that same treatise. So it's all been put together in one book, which we expected to have published by Carolina uh, Press, Carolina Academic Press some years ago. But I am told there is a problem, the, the author, the Mexican text died 20 or 30 years ago. But there is some dispute about who holds certain intellectual property rights in some of his writings. And so uh, 
that matter is unresolved. And for that reason, the, the publisher of his Mexican text that we translate into English, the Mexican publisher of the Mexican text doesn't know who has authority, who can give it authority to give us authority to have that, to give Carolina Academic Press authority to publish the English translation. So it's clogged up and it may be, may be resolved one of these days, maybe <laughs> not, I don't know. The other three, I have an article on, it's actually a book chapter on Juicio Politico, uh, we call it impeachment. And the book should have been out by now, but it's not. It's to be published, and I hope soon. Uh, I have written an article at the request of uh, a review, a lot of review in Peru on uh, the political question doctrine in U.S. jurisprudence. So that I'm told may come out as early as early next year, but who knows? And the other article is, oh, the one that I wrote most recently on the relationship between international law and internal law in the U.S. constitutional system. And that one, sometime within the next year, I would guess, should be published. So, that, that's just so diverse and so impressive. Well, I enjoyed doing it. <laughs> I hope people will be, will uh, find it useful to read. So question nine, what would you like to work on next? Most of the time I've responded to requests from journals, and so I will leave that open <laughs> and see uh, what suggestions come because doing it that way, to a certain extent, assures me of some audience. That is true. That is always very, very, very true. But I think we missed a question. Okay. What does your scholarship add to the existing body of literature? Well, I think it adds a, I'm hoping it adds for Latin American readers a U.S. perspective on U.S. law that they might not otherwise have. Uh, many lawyers in Latin America are very sophisticated. To know are familiar with the Latin, such as the Federalists and so on. But I'm, I'm hoping that my writings present a clear and concise U.S. perspective on the subject matter in question, impeachment or the political question doctrine or whatever it is I'm writing about, and the reverse when I am writing for primarily U.S. audiences about Costa Rica, for example. I hope it will give lawyers in the United States a better understanding of what is happening. Also, you know, I found there's, there's less of this now than there once was, but a few decades ago, all too many lawyers in the United States had the notion that um, there's really no law elsewhere. <laughs> and in Latin America, all they have are revolutions, golpes de Estado, and so on. And as a result, they just tend to be dismissive of what happens there or what the law is. And that's unfortunate, particularly in a city like Pittsburgh where there's potentially a great deal of international 
there are a lot of international transactions here. So, and it helps to understand why the lawyer from not just Latin America, from France or Italy or Germany uh, takes this position or says this instead of the way it would be done in the U.S. Um, it can help U.S. lawyers to understand why a civil lawyer thinks the way he or she does. Uh, why, what function courts have that may not be identical to the way we expect courts to function in the United States. Uh, all those things can be enhanced by, I hope, some things that I wrote. I know they do. Thank you. And now the 10th question, what would you like to share with your current and future students as a final thought? And this meeting is for well, the students. We have a pretty good course in the international library at the law school. <laughs> and, and you just met your professor. And I have taught here at Duquesne and would be happy to do it again. The uh, course on the law and legal, and legal process in Latin America. So those courses are available. They won't make people experts, but they will provide, I think, healthy comparative introductions. International law, that's really a different subject. That's a separate subject uh, of its own. There are civil law influences. There are common law influences in international law. And the international law isn't really one or the other. And it's not something different from anybody's particular national legal system. And again, it is very helpful for lawyers uh, who, by the way, I'm going to but every day, the chances that a lawyer in the United States will be dealing with a problem having some foreign or international aspect the chances of that happening increase every day. It's not just lawyers who regularly represent clients who do business overseas or foreign clients who do business here. Um, and it helps a great deal. A lawyer's effectiveness, the effectiveness of a lawyer in the United States is tremendously increased if that lawyer can deal intelligently with foreign counsel so that he knows what's going on, why certain things are happening, why certain things are not done. Um, and I think for that reason, any lawyer or any prospective lawyer will benefit from international law courses or comparative law courses. By comparative law courses, I mean courses that focus on the law of some foreign state or group of states. Um, also, even for a lawyer who will never have an international or foreign law transaction or problem, studying a foreign legal system or studying international law helps that lawyer have to have a better understanding of his or her own legal tradition. How it's the same, how it's different, why it works this way, why it doesn't work this way. Um, and so it is said, it's often said that a person who knows only his own language doesn't really know his own language. It is also true that a lawyer who knows only his own legal system, doesn't really know his own legal system. And so I think that a lawyer is a better lawyer, has a better understanding of the law that he practices every day, if he has, in addition to the understanding specifically of his system, an understanding of how it is done differently somewhere else, in which is his 
understanding of his own system. He's a better common law lawyer. I couldn't agree more with you. Good. <laughs> and I want to thank you for your yeah. generosity for taking all this time to to um, engage in this, I think, remarkable, rich conversation to discover your scholarship and to discover you as an amazing representative of our community. Thank you. I want to thank you for this invitation, and I want to thank you and Dean Barton for instituting this very useful, very important program. And I'm glad to be part of it. Thank you so very much. Thank you.